Take Thanks away. a lot, Jorgen. Thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work we're doing um, with you. I'm going to, you know, the, the first time I came up here, I was talking about social media um, because that was the novel data source at the time. Uh, this time, oh, just one second. All right. Huh. Okay. Oh. Good. <laughs> So this time what I'm going to be um, talking about is mobile location data. And if I put on my data geek hat, this data is really cool because it gives us, you know, the cell phone is pretty much the best data collection device you could hope for because for most of us, it's probably not outside of a five foot radius from wherever we are. That's the good part of this. That's where the potential lies in our ability to learn so much about consumers and inform our marketing decisions. The downside comes in as far as is this a little bit too invasive? Um, there was a, a landmark case on the Supreme Court, and I did not time this with the latest Supreme Court leak, but this is one of the cases where I'll give uh, Chief Justice Roberts um, credit because normally politicians don't really understand what's going on with technology. I think the court's interpretation in this case, it was a case pertaining to um, cell phones and can you be compelled to unlock your cell phone when you're arrested? And I pulled some of the excerpts that explain why the court decided that a cell phone is not like any other type of physical evidence on your body because of these, the sheer amount of data and information it contains about your life. So you know, useful information for the future. If you are ever arrested, they need a separate warrant to compel you to unlock your cell phone. Right? Um, some of, Time permitting, I'll share two projects that demonstrate the potential for location data. One is the ability to use mobile location data to put people at particular locations. And if you're doing out of home advertising, this gives us a count of was the, how many people and was this particular individual exposed to out of home advertising. Um, the other project, which was still um, in the process of working on, but I wanted to share with you is taking the idea of social networks, which have become really popular in the online space, but can we take them offline? Um, can we build a social network based on the people that you come in contact with as gleaned from your cell phones? And turns out the answer is yes. Um, to foreshadow where I'm going with this, we, the company I worked with shared enough data, we were able to construct a social network of Metro Atlanta. Um, so it gives you a sense for what can be done with data that's readily available now. Um, so that's the good news. Here are some of the examples of why we should potentially be concerned, not just as marketers, but as citizens. Uh, the New York Times had started to report on loc mobile location data and what can be learned about your behavior um, back in 2018. Among the pieces that they um, extracted from a commercially available data set was that you could re-identify people. You know, if I know that there's only one person who works for this company that lives in this zip code, I know who that person is, I can follow that person around. Uh, with the January 6th events at the Capitol, uh, they were able to track, here are the devices that were out the, at the White House, at the Ellipse, let's watch them pre um, pretty much in real time as they march to the Capitol, and let's go and identify these people because we can put you at that particular location. Um, the last point that I'd raise is this, around the sensitivity of this data. Again, using a commercially available data set, they either had data or they had the device of either the president, somebody in the senior in the administration, or somebody on the security detail because they matched up the cell phone location records to the president's daily schedule. And so this level of information, this level of granularity can be purchased by anyone. Uh, there was some news recently, SafeGraph, one of the vendors in this space, has said we will not sell locations um, pertaining to Planned Parenthood in the wake of the Supreme Court um, leak. So there's a recognition of how sensitive location data can be. And so that's where we as marketers need to be very careful in terms of how we think about using this. Uh, those of you who have iOS devices, if you've got an iPhone, uh, you're probably aware that relatively recently, Apple pushed this idea of ask to track. You know, every app on your cell phone, you'll get a pop-up window that tells you, well, we want your data, and are you willing to share it? You can say allow or ask them not to track you. And you know, this is back in 2010, so more than a decade before Apple actually implemented this, 
This is exactly what Steve Jobs had suggested, saying, let's ask consumers if it's OK. This is something that, as a field, marketing generally hasn't done. You know, we've kind of taken this let's boil the ocean strategy, let's collect any data that's available to us, and we'll figure out what to do with it later. What we're now seeing in wake of GDPR and CCPA, the, the regulations that's coming, consumers want more control over their data. Um, you know, the popular statistics that we're seeing, the uptake on Ask to Track was around 70 to 80% of iOS users took advantage of this to limit um, data collection. Right? And so that's what we're going to, that's the first thing I want to share with you is looking at what happened in the wake of this policy change. So we looked at iOS devices. So this is data from multiple states right before the policy change versus right afterwards. Um, Apple and Android devices looking a little bit different from each other, but not, not too much. But notice that after the policy change, the amount of location data we're collecting from iOS devices plummets. It almost gets cut in half. So evidence showing us that, yes, consumers are taking advantage of this. So raise the question for us, well, what's happening here? Because there are two possibilities. One possibility is I have people who want to take advantage of this to the extent that they do not allow any data collection. All right, so we have people that potentially go dark entirely. The other possibility is that people are a bit more selective in terms of which apps they allow to collect data on them. Now, our data is coming from, well, essentially a data broker. And side note, if any of you have not seen the John Oliver segment on data brokers from just a couple of weeks ago, I encourage you to go out and watch that. It is the most entertaining take on this industry. Um, but it's possible that people are selective and they'll allow some data to be collected, but not everything. So either of those explanations could explain this dip that we're seeing. Right? So the analysis we conducted said, let's look at both of these possibilities. Number one, yes or no, in a given week, are you emitting data? If so, number two, how much data are you emitting? And so we're going to look at this before versus after uh, the iOS policy change. And you know, my apologies for some, for some of these tables. Essentially, we observe both things are happening. We observe iOS devices, we lose devices entirely. Um, but we also observe among those devices we observe, we get less data. So that was kind of our overall finding and pretty much to be expected. Um, but this is the review process was really helpful in this regard because one of the reviewers says, you know, this is this is interesting, but can you tell me a little bit more about who's taking advantage of this ability to limit their tracking? So we've done two separate analyses to kind of probe this a little bit more. One is we looked at people who visited companies that had had data breaches. And our hypothesis was. If you have been notified about a data breach, it's a little bit more salient to you. You might be a little bit more sensitive about your data being shared. And so you might be more prone to take advantage of this type of policy. All right, so that, that we've proven out. I don't have that slide here. The more entertaining one, if you will, is are there certain types of people who might want to hide where they go? Well. Let's look at people who potentially go to what we deem to be sensitive locations. Well, what's a sensitive location? The suggestion that came from the journal was, let's look at gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> so we identified people in our pre-period who had attended a, a gentlemen's club and said, let's look at their future behavior compared to the rest of the population. And lo and behold, people who have got, and this, we've replicated this across like 10 different types of sensitive locations, including jails, bail bondsmen, um, different types of attorneys, different types of doctor offices. And we consistently see this effect of people who have gone to sensitive, lo uh, what we consider to be sensitive locations, are more likely to limit data sharing entirely, are more prone to reduce the amount of data that's emitted, and they do so. If you notice on an Apple device, you'll get a little red number when it's time for you to update something. That's when most people install the update. These people who go to sensitive locations install the update before that push even comes out. So giving us a little bit of thought that if you have, if you have some reason to want to limit how much data you share, then you're going to take advantage of this. Right, now, part of, the, you know, part of why I'm interested in this stream of work is 
this notion of digital privacy, do, do people want it? Apparently, the answer is yes. Well, the other side of this then is, well, how do we square things? We as marketers want data to be able to derive predictive insights. <laughs> if people limit their data, that makes my job harder. So are there ways that we can think about reducing the ability to pinpoint these people and still get the predictive insights that we're looking for? So that's the purpose of some other work I'm doing with a different batch of co-authors. Uh, but what we find here is I don't need individual level data. I think do I have whoop. I don't need the individual level data. What I can start to do, and this is what Google is, had proposed adopting, is saying on the x-axis, this is the size of the segment. I can start aggregating people together. I can start forming people into homogeneous clusters to limit my ability to re-identify them. Clarification, what are you predicting? Um, future, attend, future visitation so, at, at uh, specific brands. Yeah. So if we want to predict who are going to be my customers in the next week, in the next month, the common thought would be, well, give me the individual data because that's going to be the most predictive thing. Well, as it turns out, as we increment up the size of these clusters, as these groupings get bigger and bigger, there's an initial point at which our predictions actually get better. Now, if you make the clusters so big and say, oh, everyone's the same, this is a very odd pointer to me, that gives us the worst performance. But there is an interior mode where I'm grouping people together into groups such that I cannot identify the particular individual, and I get better insights. Now, admittedly, we screwed up the initial analysis here because we said, let's do that by using people's home locations. So not exactly privacy preserving. We said, OK, let's, let's back up. Let's come up with an alternative. Instead of looking at the data that tells me where you sleep, let's look at data that tells me where you shop. So say, throw away the residential data. Let's use the centroid of the commercial locations you've been detected at. And that's the dotted line. Performs better, at least as well, if not better than using home location. So the takeaway from this being, one, we don't need super granular, potentially invasive data. We can, we can do better with hom homogeneous segments. But the other implication of this is, I don't need all your data. And this is where the policy question comes into play of, how much data and what data should we be collecting as businesses? This would suggest I don't need residential data. Now, this works in suburban areas, won't work as well in cities where you have condo buildings and apartments in commercial areas. But we, one thing we can say is let's block out those residential areas. Don't need any of that data based on this particular objective. And so this is a space where I think marketers have to be more proactive in terms of thinking about what's the data I need, why do I need that type of data? Because the, the wave that I see coming is consumers in control of the data and being more selective in terms of who they decide to share that data with. All right, so I'm good on time. I haven't gotten a warning yet. OK, so now that I've dispensed with the doom and gloom about location data, let me share with you why I initially got into this, um, into this set of work and what, what it excited me about it. Um, so I'm not a big sports guy, but I learned from this collaboration with Emory Healthcare. Um, so we are the official team doctors of all the major Atlanta sports teams. And we pay for the right to be able to say that. And so they wanted to ask the question, is it worth it for us to be paying for this? Right? And so we had set this up as saying, let me get your healthcare billing data before the sponsorship. Let's identify the people who are at the stadium during home games. And they are, they are the ones with the potential to be exposed to in-stadium advertising associated with the sponsorship. And then let's measure their healthcare expenditures after exposure to the sponsorship. And if we're able to do that, we should be able to extract an estimate to say, what is the lift in expenditures associated with exposure to that sponsorship? So this, this is one particular use of location data. Now, most of the work that's been done in marketing so far has been around targeted advertising. Let, you're in vicinity of my store. Let me send you a targeted coupon because you're in that vicinity to try to get you in the door right now. What we're suggesting is we can use this as a means of conducting the uh, marketing attribution. So 
uh, time frame that we have. We do um, a diff and diff analysis, um, matching to the best of our ability to um, control for those observables at least. And what we see is, yes, there's an impact of people being exposed. They tend to spend more. Um, what moderates it is um, the lower box here, the relationship breadth is suggesting that the more departments within the healthcare system you have visited previously, the less effective this ad is in terms of increasing your expenditure. And so this is, this is working more as a customer acquisition tool. You know, customers that we've already acquired who have deep relationships with us, we're not seeing much, much of an impact. But for people who haven't been our customers previously, that's where we're seeing uh, more, more of an effect. And so one thing that we could do from this for the organization was say, well, give me the number. Give me the estimate for how much incremental revenue uh, was generated. Uh, um, and so in this particular case, I want to say we had figured it to be um, between 900,000 and 1.2 million was kind of the range that we were able to give them as far as saying, based on this analysis, this is kind of the incremental um, expenditures associated with it. And that could be used to inform future decisions. So we're now looking at deploying a similar methodology to look at airport exposures because we now have taken over part of the airport um, with advertising. So seems to be a space um, from an outdoor advertising and sponsorship perspective where mobile location data um, potentially has some use. Uh, the other piece of use for this, um, as I mentioned at the start, the trying to leverage offline social networks. Well, first, how do we build the network? So two conditions have to be met for us to say two people are connected to each other. One, you are in the same geographic area. So we set a threshold of 10, this was 10 meters, we've done it for five meters. But it, that, uh, that co-occurrence has to occur within a given period of time, right? And so if you and I are in the same, we're close to each other, but it's at the same time because we're getting mobile pings from different devices. It's not going to be at the exact same time. So we compare the coordinates to say, are they physically close to each other? Then we compare the timestamps to say, did this happen in close proximity? And so that's allowing us to build out a co-location network. What we're doing with that co-location network is saying, let's look at where people tend to visit. Suppose that you visit a coffee shop. Collaborative filtering of recommendations would be based on, let's find the people who visited a coffee shop. Where else do they tend to shop? Right? That would be our standard approach for making recommendations, for predicting where else you are likely to visit. What we're suggesting is, let's add the co-location network to this. Say, people who visit the coffee shop, let me look at where their connections shop. And use, so we're adding information about your social contacts um, in terms of making predictions of where you're going to shop in the future. We're still wrapping this up, but our preliminary results suggest that compared to models that ignore the co-location data, we're improving predictions by about 50% by adding the co-location network. Um, so pretty big lift um, in terms of performance, where we are hoping to take this, and fortunately my doctoral student's only in her second year, so I've got a few more years to work <laughs> with her on this. But what we're hoping to do is use this to try to get at identifying offline influencers. That is, if I've got the time series of data of where you go and where your social connections go, and if there are exogenous shocks that are happening throughout this observation period, like openings of stores or openings of restaurants, we can look at the sequence of timing of, let's say, if Ji Wong is the influencer, he goes to the new sushi place first, and maybe he tells all of his friends, and then we go to afterwards. If that repeatedly happens when new things open and I never go first, he's always the one going first, that's going to allow us to get closer to this idea of um, inferring offline social influence. So taking the same idea of online social media and who are the, quote, influencers um, there, let's bring it into the offline context. So that's one of the big opportunities that I see uh, with mobile location data. So I know I talked fast, but I wanted to get all of that in there. So thank you for uh, letting me ramble for a little while. And I